You know, it's such a fine privilege of being among the people and then being my first time in a Jewish synagogue. It's uh, quite a rare treat for me. And then understanding more of this, um, the order here of the of these scrolls and how they're taken care of and so forth. It'd be a good time to come in sometime and have a healing service in this synagogue to have the, the Jews. And thank you, brother. Thank you very much. I've always had a feeling for the Jewish people. Perhaps there's none here but this morning, but I have a feeling for them, always have, and I believe that someday the the Gentile church will take the message to the Jew as the Jew gave it to the Gentile. I believe that with all my heart. And then when that goes back to the Jew in full, you watch the Gentile door will close then, and it'll be Jew. So now's the time. I'm so glad to be in <laughs> right now on the inside. God bless this gracious little man, uh, Brother Michelson. I've never seen him in my life. I wouldn't know him if he was standing here. He might be in the audience, and I would not know it. But I've heard his program, and I appreciate it. A great servant of God. A poor little Jew that uh, gave his life now in service for God. I, and for, I like the way he says that, my Jesus. <laughs> my Jesus. I think that was so striking for a Jew to say that. He certainly has been a torch barrier, a torch holder for the Jewish people in this country around across America here. And my sincere prayer is God give them feeble old arm strength to hold it until Jesus comes. I admire him. I admire old man when they fought good fights. Remember Dr. F. F. Bosworth, one of my associates, when I went in to see him, he's eighty four years old, had his little arms out like that. And they, back there, they just come off the fields of Africa at 80 years old, missionary with me in the jungle. And I run to him and throw my arms around him. I knew he was dying. And I cried out, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Such a gallant man. And he said, this is the happiest time of all my life, Brother Branham. He said, I said, you know you're dying? He said, I can't die. I've already been dead for 60 years, he said. Um, he said, I'm just waiting a moment when I see all that I have lived for, see him walk in that door to invite me to his house. And so that's the way I think of then lives of great men all remind us and we can make our lives sublime with partings leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. It's true. Yes. Uh, I might not have heard just, I heard that he shaved hands with uh, standing in the room, Shane. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, I heard that. That's all right, Brother Kopp. I'm glad that you remind me of. Yes, he said quite a while before he died or went home, he uh, raised up and shaking hands with converts of his that come to Christ through his ministry for a long time and then gave up the spirit and went on to be with him. What a gallant. And I just love such things as that. That's just, um, the brethren, it's such a privilege to be here in Los Angeles or this Southgate, whatever it might be called here, where we're having a meeting with this fine fellowship. It's, uh, you're inviting me in here. And I, I would not have come if I hadn't had some kind of a pulling to come. And I realized that, that uh, my ministry has become a place where it's almost a showdown. I, like all things come to, that uh, I, they begin to speak things the world has and associations and so forth that I'm a false prophet and and everything, and I looked for that to come. I wondered if it hadn't come before now. And, um, but I'm looking for it to get even worse. And to find that in this hour uh, of my trials and deep distress going through, uh, it's you, brethren, throw open your arms. And uh, 
I appreciate you. The Lord bless you. And I'm here to do everything that I know how to do to, to help your churches to be stronger, to unite the brotherhood together in one heart. And that's the purpose that I have. And to, as I said last night, to sane every little corner and catch every little minna uh, that can be caught for the kingdom of God. And now, last night, I was late. And we got started late. And I'm nearly always late. <laughs> My mother said I was a full nine months baby. <laughs> and I was kind of late getting here. And I was born only weighing five pounds, and I had a bad start, and never did get very big, and I am just I was late for my wedding. Uh, I kept my wife waiting a long time, and it's always wait and late. Now, if I can just be late for my funeral, that's all. <laughs> that's all. Uh, just let them wait as long as they can, because I, I want to be just as long as I can to preach the gospel and fellowship with my brethren. And now, well, I'll try to be just a little quicker tonight. Last night... Now, it's just ministry here, as I understand. I'm trying to set a bait. Now, there's sinners sitting out there. See? And the first thing, you might have wondered why I didn't make an altar call. The first thing, I felt that I was just a little late, and that tires the people and so forth. But just a little bait under the discernment or something, and that'll get, their, get them attracted. And then spread your net way around, you see, and then bring them in. Just, just bear with me now. <laughs> I'm going just the way I think the Spirit leads me to go. And now, if we do get some into the net that wants to be saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, brethren, you know what district they're out of. Get them to your church, because that just pull them to the altar is about as far as we can get them there. And then uh, you take them the rest of the way from there. Take them in and baptize them and stay with them until they receive the Holy Ghost. And, and that's what we're here for in this great, dark, hour is the sun setting in the west and the evening lights out. And I'm among the people, if you, many of you, it's no secret, you all have my tapes, all of you, and, but among the people out there, I just don't approach on scriptural strong doctrines as I would like as in the tabernacle or something, and, and on the tapes where ministers could take it and study it. I come up this morning with a Greek from the old country. And uh, he's got my six-hour tape on the seed word. And he tells me that it just goes just a little bit each day and take those uh, and break it down and bring it into the Greek. And how he was showing how me not knowing nothing about how it just sets together like that. That's for study. In here, we're trying to fish. This is it. We're putting the bait out there. And we never show the fish the hook. You show him the bait. He grabs the bait and gets the hook. So that's, uh, so that's most of my time in praying for the sick and things, is just to catch the sinner's eye. That's the bait. But the hook, the gospel hook, you use that. I'll just shake the bait before him, you see. So you, uh, you use uh, uh, the hook. So then, um, and tonight, I will try to make our little talks a little more shorter, you know, so I can just, and Brother Borders speaks a little bit before I do, and, and come in, and I'll try to make my speeches or little talks just uh, juvenile to you, brethren, and, and uh, as you would think of that, of course, anything I could say would probably be juvenile to you, but uh, uh, you all are teachers, and I'm not a teacher. And, uh, um, but my purpose is to try to help the kingdom of God, try to strengthen your churches, and strengthen brotherhood among man as we're waiting for the coming of the Lord. And I'm sure you'll understand that. And now... Uh, uh, this here, Los Angeles, is I've noticed this morning and met my, some of my friends here, Brother Softman there from Jeffersonville, originally a Canadian. Brother Tom is also a Canadian. It's sojourning with us in Jeffersonville at this time. And, and Brother Welch Evans there from uh, Tifton, Georgia, also a sojourner with us, driving 1,500 miles every Sunday for hear me preach the gospel. Uh, and there is Brother uh, Norman from, and Sister Norman and Sister Evans and Brother Willie. I can't ever think a little group sitting in a little huddle there. It's come out here with us. And um, to 
pray with us and to strengthen as we go on in for the service. Glad to have them with us in the meetings. Now, in setting this meeting up, uh, I looked and we had a book of meetings, just people in the difficult that we're having now between the denominational brethren and many of them, they, the denominational brethren, as you all are, yet I'd like to, over this pulpit this morning, express my view, see. The, you know yourselves, brethren, among your people. You can say something this way, and one will take it this way and start leaning it this way. And he'll tell it to the next one, the next one, to the next one. The first thing you know, it's all together out of cater. And one will lean it this way and take it the other way. You know that. And I'm sure that you, brethren, understand that that's the way a lot of things are said about me, that it's just taken by some and misunderstood and just led off. It's not the meaning at all. As far as being against a denomination, certainly not. My brethren are there. It's just like there's too many people today depending on the denomination. Now, we've got a brother sitting here from the United Brethren Church and different places. It's, them denominations are all right as long as you stretch the car a little bit farther over it can open up the gate and drink at the third well. You know what I mean, a Jacob Doug, and, and um, I can have a fellowship. But when you come, as long as you belong to the denomination, that's all you have to do. No, there's a lot more than that to it, brother. And that's where the whole world is always. And you, we have sitting here with us this morning a fine historian. And we know that churches, as soon as they draw that line, denomination, we are it. Right there, God leaves them and they die and never revive again. See? There's no history of where ever a church ever fell and ever rose again. It doesn't. And um, because when I first come into this, in this uh, ministry, it was you, brethren, of the United Pentecostal Church that opened your arms first for me. That was Brother Richard Reed, Brother Jack Moore, and Brother Ben Pemberman, and, and St. Louis, my first meeting. And the first meeting I ever attended to was, and know anything about, the, was the PAW and PAJC as they was, before the emergent come together, Brother um, uh, Rao at Mishawaka. And i never seen such a fine a fellowship of brethren. Well, then I found out, I thought that's all Pentecost was. That was Pentecost. But I found out there were different groups all around everywhere, and there were fine men in each one of them. So I tried to stand the breach with my arms out, trying to call every brother to a unity, a fellowship, so that we can have an understanding, no matter what they believe, as long as we are brethren, because I'm sure if I had put myself, there's a lot of flaws that God could point his finger in my face this morning and say, young man, you're a long ways from being perfect yourself. So uh, that's why I've tried to feel about everybody to draw them together. Now, that's my purpose, is to have union fellowship. God ever bless you. And in the, as I started to say a few moments ago, in the midst of all of this, yet there is hundreds of places that's calling and from the mission field. And now I've got an evangelistic trip. I'm crossing the country. And as soon as I leave that, I'm going into the foreign countries on a missionary trip. And I'm trying in myself that I haven't got time to explain, seeking something uh, from God because I believe that the approach coming of Christ is closer than we really are thinking of. I believe it's right at the door. And it really makes me nervous when I think of it. Not nervous for myself, but nervous of this. Have I done my very best? Is there one more ounce in me that I could give for the kingdom of God? Is there something that I could have done? Because this is the only opportunity we're ever going to have right now. And I have, I have scolded the church. I've scolded our people. I've scolded our sisters for cutting their hair. I've scolded them for wearing makeup. I've scolded our brothers for permitting them to do it. And our ministers and things like that. Not because that I have anything against them. It's because that I'm, I'm jealous of them. They're God's heritage. And, I, and I've scolded my minister brothers for, not, for just drawing themselves into one little uh, thing in a group. Now, I'd think if there was a denomination that would say, we believe this 
comma, plus all that God can add to us. But when we make our denominational rim, we say, we believe this, period. And the Holy Spirit moves right in and moves right out of it. That's right, see? Now, if we can end it with a comma, then we just keep on growing. Recently, I had a, a meeting with the Lutheran brother, and I guess you all heard of it, at Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. And, uh, oh my, did he ever rake me over the coals in a 22-page letter. He said, the very idea. said, um, I drove 15 miles last night through a blinding snowstorm. Thought I would hear a servant of Christ. And what did I hear but a polished-up soothsayer? And, oh, he, and said, the very idea of you, a man, with 15 years in the mission fields, and, and say you've been preaching the gospel for 25 years, and said, then here to hear you use the grammar that you use and, and the very doctrine that you, you speak. He said, you even said so much last night that Satan could not heal. He said, shame on you for such a remark. And I thought, a dean of a Lutheran college. And he said, right not far from our college here, there's a woman with a familiar spirit. She puts a big apron on, and the people comes in, and she puts her, ha her hands on them, and then she plucks their veins and get a little hair from the back of her neck and roll it up, get the blood on there, and walk down to a creek behind her and throws it over her head like that into the creek, starts walking out with her hands and said, the people standing up there, if she's constrained to look back, the disease is on the blood of the person in her hair. And said, then when look back, the disease will come back to the person. But if not, said the person's to get well. And said about 20% of those get well. And then you say the devil can't heal. Oh, he had a good mental approach. But brother, that's not what we approach, not mental. We approach the Scripture. Amen. So I, I just thought, well, 22 page later, didn't even address his brother. He just said, Branham. So I thought, well, he said, and you talk about your years, that I was preaching the gospel before you was born. Well, I thought a man that's preached the gospel that long should have respects, no matter what he is, see? We should respect him. So I sat down and addressed him, uh, my little scratching, the best I could, two pages back, to recognize him. And I, I said, uh, Brother dear, I sure appreciate the many years that you have uh, spent in all this. I said, I, I appreciate it, a servant of Christ, and I do appreciate the criticism. Now, a man that can't take criticism, there's something wrong with his experience, you see, because God sends criticism to us to correct us, to make us see our, our bad points. I've been helped so much by criticism. That's friendly criticism. Just not get nasty and angry, but just, uh, just friendly criticism. So I said, uh, I appreciate it, sir. And then I said, but just one thing I would like to express here is you... Speaking of my grammar, of course, I am not I have no education, that's true. But I said, the thing, what surprises me, that a dean of a Lutheran college would base his theology up on an experience instead of the Word of God. When you talked about the witch that could heal, I said, Jesus said, if Satan can cast out Satan, then his kingdom's divided. He cannot heal. Now, you can... See, if he can, Jesus said he couldn't heal, and you said he could heal, I'm going to believe Jesus. Okay? That's right. Because he said, let every man's word be wrong and his right. And I said, I believe Jesus. And it's surprising to me that a dean of a Lutheran college would base his theology up on the, an experience or an emotion instead of the Word of God. I said, uh, dean or anyone else, any minister should base his theology up on the word of the Lord. And I said, I'm uh, certainly in what you call to be a soothsayer. I said, I presume that was a discernment. And I said, did you know that the Pharisees and Sadducees once made that remark themselves when they seen the same thing done by our Lord, called him Beelzebub? I said, now perhaps what if I am right? Now, Jesus said, when the Holy Ghost has come to do the same, that to speak a word against it would never be forgiven in this world or the world to come. No matter about your 50 years of being preaching, a word against the Holy Spirit, I said, I forgive you for that. And I know that God will, for he's seen that you didn't understand it. And I wrote him the nicest letter that I could. Later, I got a, <laughs> a letter inviting me to come up. So... <laughs> I had a, pardon me, I had a, 
a businessman's breakfast up there and was speaking for the full gospel businessman. And Mr. Moore, Brother Jack Moore, many of you brethren are acquainted with him, one fine man. And I, he, this, Dr. Egery came to, to Brother Moore and asked him if I could, if he'd bring me over to the college. Uh, well, I'm sure in for it now. <laughs> so I, Brother Moore's a theologian, so I thought, well, I'd better take him along. And uh, so I said, you sit right next to me, and if he speaks some words and grammar that I don't understand, I'll kick you on the leg like that, and you take from there on. And he said, all right. So we went over to the college, and when we got there, they had a place uh, about the size of this auditorium here for the, the dinner, and not as Norwegian people, and they had their dinner set and very fine, nice, and the dean sat next to on one side and his associates the other. And so after it finished, he said, Brother Branham, we want to ask you some questions. I said, let me kind of first have a word. I said, I I'm, might not be able to answer your question. I said, I, if I can't, it'd be all right, Brother Moore, to help me here. I said, but I've... Uh, uh, I may not be good at answering your questions, but I'll do what I can. And he said, here's what it is. He said, we have heard of Pentecostals years and years. And said, we went to see them and said, what did we find but kicking over the chairs and knocking out the windows and, and everything like that. said, all the noise we ever heard in our life. said, what's those people got? I said, the Holy Ghost. He said, the Holy Ghost? I said, yes. I said... He said, have you always been a Pentecostal? I said, well, I once belonged to the Missionary Baptist Church when I was just a boy. I was ordained. But I said, immediately after I got ordained, I said, I, I got the Holy Ghost, so I guess I've been Pentecostal. He said, you mean to tell me that's Pentecostal, them Pentecostal people, that's the Holy Ghost making them kick over the chairs and carry on like that? I said, yes, it's the Holy Ghost. I said, the thing of it is, I said, they got so much pressure built up, steam, they blow it out the whistle instead of put it in the engine and make the wheels roll, see? I said, that's all. I said, I said that's right. I said, they so much steam there, they just have to toot it out the whistle. That's all I know, see? And I said, they can't hold it no longer. And he said, well, I said, if I could get fundamental teaching in Pentecostal faith or Pentecostal faith in fundamental teaching... Them people are servants of God, but they really don't realize the position that they hold. That's all. And he said, well, what do you think we Lutheran has got? I said, the Holy Ghost. <laughs> then he stopped. And he said, now I don't know what to ask you. I said, well, uh, I understand you got about a thousand acres here. Is you putting corn? I said, if the students are not able to pay their way through, then they can work their way through the college. He said, right. So the Lord gave me a little thought, and I said, Sir, one time there was a man who broke up a great field of, to plant corn, and he planted his corn in the field, and the next one morning he went out, and when he looked out upon his field, he saw two little blades, anyone knows that raised corn, that's how it comes up, what we call the sprig corn down the south, just comes up like that, two little blades. And I said, the man stood on his doorstep and said, Praise the Lord for my crop of corn. I said, now, did he have a crop of corn? He said, well, he, he had a start. And I said, well, potentially he had a crop of corn. See? He had it in its infant farm. And I said, that was you Lutheran. And I said, finally, that corn grew up to a place that had a tassel. And you know what the tassel did? The tassel looked back down to the blades and said, I have no use for you anymore. I'm a tassel. But it had to use the blade again in order to reproduce itself. Then it brought forth from this tassel back into the, the blade, it brought forth uh, a ear. I said, now the first was you, Lutheran, the second was the Methodist move of God. And the third, the ear, was the Pentecostal group that brought back a restoration of the gifts to the church of the original grain that went into the ground. It's just restoring again, as Joel said. See? I said, now, I know we got a lot of fungus on that ear, but yet we got some grains there, too. You know, I said, we, and, uh, I said, and uh, he said, well, I said, that is the original grain. I said, now, the Pentecostal church is the advanced Lutheran church. After all, the, if there had been no leaf, 
there would have been no tassel, and the life that was in the leaf made the tassel, and the life that was in the tassel made the grains. So it's an advanced church of the living God. And he stopped, pushed back his plate. He said, Brother Branham, I went west one time. To, I wrote a, heard a book wrote of, um, about all the spiritual gifts and said, I, I went west to find the man and said, when I did, he said, oh, I just wrote about him. I didn't have him. He said, I just wrote about him. Well, said, I could have done that. And said, I went around and I noticed all this and I went to the Pentecostal groups and so forth and said, I, I noticed him shouting. You see, it just happened to be there. The devil put him there at the wrong time. You know, when the people were really rejoicing, now he's got an opinion and went out. See? And he said, I apologize for the letter that I wrote you. said, I built myself up with such a place that I was against it, and that's where I pinned it down right there and said, you wasn't nothing but a soothsayer. He said, I asked you to forgive me. I said, why, well, certainly, sir. I would never hold nothing. He never did to the, you know, what I told you in the letter. He said, I wanted to hear it from your lips. He said, now, Brother Branham, to me and all the students, we're all hungry for the Holy Ghost. What must we do? So you know what I told him, don't you? <laughs> I said, turn your backs, your backs this way and your faces to the wall all the way around. And make a purpose in your heart that you'll never leave your knees until God gives you the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now I said, now don't think about this or that or the other. Just stay there and say, God, I want the Holy Ghost. I went around and laid hands on them, and 40 received the Holy Ghost right then. And now there are about 500 of them strong, going, having signs, miracles, and wonders, and so forth. See? Brethren, I believe that we have the thing that the world must have. But we've got to approach it in a way, what if you were a carpenter? Let's take the man on the end here. Our brother Borders over there is a carpenter, I believe. Well, what if he was driving with a hammer like this and driving nails, and I had an automatic hammer of some sort that I could pour a keg of nails into it and hold up like this and drive them boards up like that? A whole lot better than he could with his hammer. Now, if I walk up to him and say, Ah, oh, boy, you're not even in it. You know nothing about it. Well, you're mashing your fingers. Ah, you, you just haven't got a product to begin with. I'm offending him. I'll never sell the hammer. That's right. See, it's my approach with what I have. My product, I know, is better than what he's got, but I've got to remember I've got to approach him in the right way. And if I walk up to him and say, How do you do, sir? Uh, my name is Branham. Mine is Borders. I see you're a carpenter. Yes, yes, sir, I am. I really believe you're a real carpenter, too. Yes. I was watching the way you was hammer. Handling your hammer. Oh, yes. Oh, Betsy's been with me a long time. I said, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, sure good, too, and you can really handle it. Yeah, go ahead and talk to him a while. I said, ha did you ever hear of the new such and such a hammer? Uh, no, I don't believe I ever did. But here it is. You put your nails in here, and it lets us tack those boards up down. Now, look at the time this does, and what a product I got. Show it to him like that. Say, take it. Try it for a few days. and See what you think about it. I'll be back. See, if it's the right kind of a product, it'll sell itself. You know what I mean, don't you, brethren? See, see we got the right thing. We got to approach the people with it right. See, that's the thing. See, it's a real genuine thing. This is the Holy Spirit. I believe it with all my heart. I don't believe it, brethren, are renegades. I believe they are brethren. I do not believe that the Spirit that does the discernment is any sincere. I believe it's the Holy Spirit revealing himself in his church, just making the church come to its place. And if we could just have some way that we could take the whole Pentecostal move and just break down our little uh, bears and a place to come together and set in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, to which we are baptized in by one Spirit, oh, I think there would be manifestations that had never been known before. And we could approach the Methodists, the Baptists, the Pentecostals, could go everywhere to every place. I believe it could be done. Brethren, I don't want to stand here. I want to read just a word or two from the Bible and talk to you just a moment. But I wanted, I know you got to go, and I have to. And I got that breakfast the next, uh, Saturday morning, and, and then it's anticipating uh, to stay from Monday night to another one down here. I don't know just yet. I have to talk to Brother Borders and so forth. But I want to leave this with you. 
but I'm here to help you. It's just, we don't have just set together a few minutes. I wish we could just stay here until the service started this afternoon and then in the morning come back again and I listen to what you brethren had to say and I appreciate it. But I, just to let you know my heart, I appreciate you and I'm going to do all that I can to help you as my brothers to with what little ministry the Lord's given me and what he's given you that we're putting it together now to see what we can do for his kingdom. Let us bow our heads just a moment before we approach his word. Most gracious God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come to thee with humble, contrite spirits, broken up, Lord, knowing that we are ready for the molding as the prophet went down to the potter's house to be molded. And Father, we desire this morning in our hearts that you'll break us so that we'll be molded into different characters, characters that will represent Jesus Christ. Take my foolish heart, Lord. Take my stammering words and break them to pieces, Lord. Break my own self-will out and make a new person Christ. Grant it, Lord. That's the desire of our hearts. That's why we're here. And Lord, while we're speaking to you over this altar for this little Jewish brother who believes in you, uh, Brother Michelson, I, I pray for him, Father. I pray that you'll bless him. And we're thankful for the opportunity to be here in this Christian synagogue. Bless us together now as we just wait a few moments on reading the word, bless it to our thoughts. Bless our services, Lord. God, you know our heart. And I just want to be knitted with one heart and one soul and one purpose. That is with my brethren here. That here in this dark, dismal land of this 20th century, down here in 1962, near the turn of a century again, the time is up. And over here on the West Coast, where civilization has traveled from east to west, and we realize that it can't go no farther now, we go back east again when we leave this coast. And as civilization has come, we realize the sun travels east to west. And there was a time when the S O N came upon the eastern people, and he showed great light and signs that he was the Messiah. And he promised, the prophet said, there would be a day that could not be called day or night. We've had this dismal, foggy day of 2,000 years almost, of just being able to believe enough light to get around by and knowing that he was the Son of God and build us a church and an organization and try to hold brothers and sisters together and call them to live right. But, Lord, the fog is clearing away. There's coming a light on the Western people, the same S-O-N with the same signs, the same gospel, a restoration. You promised in the last days that there would come forth a message that would restore the faith of the children back to the fathers. Oh, God, let us return to that original day of Pentecost. Let us come back to that great uh, faith that was once delivered to the saints. May the great bride tree of God that the palmer worms has eaten down bring forth in this top of it the fruit that the evening lights will ripen for the coming of the Son of God. Grant it, Lord. Help us as we pull together for this purpose. We commit ourselves to you. We are yours. Do with us, Lord, as you see fit. We commit ourselves this morning in this synagogue. Into your hands, Lord. May your great purpose be achieved in our lives as we give ourselves wholly to you. Not as Samson. Samson gave his strength, but he never gave his heart. God, may our heart, our strength, our all, our all be given to you. Make it mighty, Lord. Multiply it for the kingdom of God's sake. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In the 16th Psalm, just for a, a way of reading the last verse, 
Thou wilt show me the path of life, and in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there is pleasure forevermore. And now, you know I wouldn't try to preach. I would just like to talk to you a minute, or say, for instance, about 15, 20 minutes. David here was speaking of life. Thou wilt show me the path of life. Did you notice it? Will you show me, or could you show me? I hope you show me. Thou wilt show me. I believe that every one that God has called will hear and will come. I believe that that's what we are facing now in our meetings. We can only sow the seed. Some will fall by the wayside. Some will fall one way and some fall another, but some will fall on good ground. That is right. Show me the path of life. Now, life is the greatest thing that we could achieve. There's nothing no greater than life. If I could go to glory this morning and we could all go up there and I could meet Abraham, what's the greatest thing there is, Abraham? He'd say, life. There, no matter what anything else is, life is the greatest thing that anyone can achieve, is life. What would you give for life? I've got a book at home. And I, I believe it was wrote by Brother Nugent, a uh, chaplain from the prisons. And he gives the testimonies in this book of the great people that's died on earth and uh, from the time of Christ down. And he gives the testimony of the wicked great and the testimony of the spiritual great on the other side of the book. And I was reading there, I believe it was Bloody Mary of England, where she said, If I could, oh, I'd give my kingdom. For five minutes more life, the kingdom that she'd put them into death because and so forth, and yet she would give that kingdom for five more minutes of life. I still remember the testimony of Paul Rader right out here when he died there in the tabernacle, or had the tabernacle, when he said when he was dying, he called Luke, his brother. They kind of chummed together like Billy Paul, my son and I, and he is, I understand it from the Moody School that they had a quartet in their singing. And Paul had a sense of humor. They're singing, Near my God to thee. And he said, Hey, who's dying here, me or you? And said, Raise up them shades and sing me some snappy gospel songs. And they started singing down at the cross, something like that, the quartet. And he said, Where's Luke? And he's in the next room. They brought him in. He took a hold of Luke's hand. He said, Luke, think of it. In five minutes in now, I'll be standing in the presence of Jesus Christ, clothed in his righteousness. Let me go like that. Dwight Moody, you know what his testimony was when he raised up and said, This is death. said, This is my carnation day. That's the way I like to go. I held the hand of my precious mother just recently going. I held the hand of my wife when she went. I've watched them when they come to the end of the road. Life is the greatest thing there is. And those who have no hope after this is over, it's a terrible thing. We walk down the paths of life. So many people say, what is life? Where can I find it? Why, it's just all around us. God has made it so much, even like in, in Job. We find out in, the, uh, in Job, he asked about it. All, the, all down through life, we hear it asking about it. reminds me of a, a little boy that lived out in Jeffersonville where I lived. One day they said he was, uh, went to his mother and he said, uh, Mother, uh, God, this God that you talk about is such a great person. Uh, could anybody see him? She said, Ask the pastor. So went to the pastor and asked him. He said, uh, No, a Sunday school teacher. And the Sunday school teacher said, You better ask the pastor. She didn't know. So I went to the pastor. He said, No, no, son. He said, No man can see God and live. He said, You don't see God. Well, it kind of disappointed a little fellow. And there's an old fisherman. And uh, it's up on the river one day with this old fisherman fishing, and it come up a storm, as many of you, I guess, are from the east and know how the washes off the leaves, and he's coming down the river, and a little boy was sitting in the back of the boat, and the sun was setting to the west, and a rainbow come across the river like that, and the old fisherman oaring, and the waters had quietened from the storm, and everything was fresh, and the smell of the blossoms, 
And as he paddled over his gray beard, big silver tears began to flow down his beard as he looked. And the little boy looked around to see what he was looking at. He looked at the old fisherman. He run up from the stern of the boat up to the uh, uh, center of the boat, and he sat down by the old fisherman's knees, and he said, Sir, I want to ask you something. My mother's not able to answer me, my Sunday school teacher nor my pastor. said, Is God being so great could any man see him? And the old fisherman pulled the oars into his lap, put the little boy's head over against his shoulder, said, God bless your little heart, honey. All I've seen for the past 40 years has been God. See? You, just, you have to have God in here to see him out there. See? God on the inside looking through your eyes. I'm looking across the street to a tree. I'm thinking now I want to come through the Mojave Desert or the desert coming down here. Everything seemed to be so dead. And just as I got there close to the Colorado River, there was one little green bush. It was so conspicuous. I thought, where is this getting its life from? See, it had life. It was a living. God is in, in life. He's everything that's alive has God in it. Job said one day, if a tree dies, it'll live again. But man layeth down, he giveth up the ghost, he, and where is he? His sons come to mourn and pay him honor, but he perceiveth not. Oh, that thou would hide me in the grave and keep me in the secret place that our wrath be past. And he, he seen, he noticed God in his nature, in life. How a little flower comes up, stands there, and after a while, it's pretty, and there's some young ones in the bed of the, of the flowers, and some middle-aged and some old ones, but when the frost comes and strikes them, it kills them all. And the little flower drops its little uh, petals off, and out of that flower bud is a little black seed, little teeny fella, falls out, and as strange as it seems, but yet God has a funeral procession for that flower. Did you know that? The fall rains come and he cries great big tears down of water and he buries that little seed down in the ground. Long comes the winter, freeze and freeze it, burst the pulp runs out of it. Every natural thing that you could look at is gone. A scientist could take a handful of that dirt and take it down to the laboratory and examine it back and forth and you cannot find that germ of life. It's not there. The, the potash and calcium and petroleum and moisture, everything that's in it has returned back into the dust, but somewhere hid in there is a germ of life. And just as sure as the sun rises again in the springtime, it'll live again. God has provided a way for it. You take and put concrete down through your yard in the wintertime. Lay stones. Where is your greatest uh, grass bed? It's right around the edge of your walk. Why? It's those seeds that was covered up. And when that sun begins to shine upon that botany life, that little seed of life will whiz way around all that concrete over every rock, down under every stick, and come around until it sticks its little head up outside and praises the God of life. You just can't hide life. That's what we're here for, brethren, to bring life. Not long ago, I was sitting eating dinner with an old Methodist minister, gracious old saint of God. He had the Holy Spirit in his life. And we were listening to the Agriculture Hour come on from Louisville, and the 4-H Club had, had a machine that they could perfect a grain of corn so perfect that it would make just as good a cornbread as the one that's grown out of the field. Same kind of corn flakes. And actually, you could cut them open, put them in a laboratory, and his heart was in the right place, the right amount of moisture and, and potash and all that's in the corn. You could not separate them once, mix them together. You could not tell one from the other. It was so perfect. He said, the only way that you can tell which is which is bury them. The one that machine made rots, and that's all of it. But the one that God growed, it's got a life in there that'll rise up again. A man might look like a Christian, impersonate a Christian, or walk like a Christian, or so forth, but unless that germ of life is there, he cannot rise again. Jesus said, I come that they might have life, Zoe, God's own life in them. And there's everything that had a beginning has an end. It's those things which had not a beginning that has no end. 
There's only one thing that never had a beginning. That was God. And we become his children, part of him. Then Zoe, God's own life, eternal life, is imparted to us. And that's the only way that we can live, and that's the only way that our lost friends out here, even church members, can ever live again, is because Zoe has been imparted to them, and we become a part. Did you notice on the day of Pentecost how that this great pillar of fire, which we all know was the messenger of the covenant, which was Jesus Christ, that Moses sustained the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he forsook Egypt, following that great messenger, this light. On the day of Pentecost, when this great light came in there, God divided himself, tongues of fire set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. God separating himself from one being to being in his church, dividing his life with his people. That's the message we must get to the people. They'll perish without it. They have to. My old mother just passed away recently when I stood by her side and she said, Billy, all of our children, was, uh, her children was standing there. What was living? Two of us was gone out of ten. And the girl, she looked at me and she said, first she looked at Dolores. She said, my last and my first. And Mother was a gracious Christian, and I led her to Christ and baptized her many years ago. And she said, Dolores, you've been good to me. You've helped me. You have, uh, you have done me a washing for me when I've gotten old and can't wash. You come down to clean up my house. You do these things. She said, I love you, honey. And Dolores, a young Christian, standing there choking, looking down, and she said, Mother, it was so little. She said, Billy. You seen that I didn't go hungry? And I said, Mama, how many times have you walked away from the table so I could have something to eat when we were had nothing to eat? And I said, It's just a duty, Mother. And she said, Then you kind of been a spiritual guide to me, Billy. You baptized me. You've told me the way of life. I said, Mama, you know our background is Catholic. And I said, And I, I. I went to the church, but they said, this is the church, and it was contrary to the Word. I went from church to church, and I found out it was so contrary, so I stayed with the Word, Mother. And I said, I've tried to tell you what was right and lead you to Christ. And the dear old saint went away to meet God, and then I committed her soul back to God. Dolores called me, and she said, Billy, I, I just can't get over it. She said... Mother, I said, Dolores, look out across the road from where you live. Isn't there a large oak tree standing there? She said, yes, this was just a few days before Mother died. And she said, uh, yes. I said, it's coming fall now. I said, about a month ago, those leaves were real pretty and green. Yes, uh, she said, Bill. I said, when was, what does it look like now? And she said, well, they're yellow and brown and green, red, and I said, Dolores, what makes them turn yellow, brown, green, and red? She said, they are dying. I said, when was the tree its prettiest? She said, now. I said, the Bible said, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. That's when the time comes. I said, the life is going back. Life is a tree. We are all hanging on a tree of life. That is right. Mr. Wood, who's the book salesman in the meeting, he was a Jehovah Witness, and he was, uh, uh, had a boy. It's with him also. His leg drawn up like this with polio. And he had been in Louisville in one of the meetings, and he noticed that the sermon, and he said, Now, that seems right to me. And so he went to Houston, Texas, when it was there with... Uh, Brother Kidson and them, when the picture of the angel of the Lord was taken, and um, what's well, been taken in several times, and just recently uh, uh, taken again, is taken in Germany and many times. So, and, and Brother Wood had brought his boy and was up at one of the meetings, and they were sitting way back, oh, almost a half a city block or farther away, one night standing on the platform, never heard of him in my life. And just standing there, looking around, I noticed a vision from him, and I said, there's a man, 
He's sitting way back in the back, him and his wife, and they're from the state of Kentucky, way down to a place called LaGrange, Kentucky. His name is Wood. He is a carpenter. He's got a boy that has a polio uh, 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 damage that's pulled his leg up. Thus saith the Lord, the boy is healed. And just started on like that. And his wife was a Methodist, so I believe a Church of God, Anderson Church of God. So I said, did you hear that, Ruby? And so he said, David, stand up. His leg was just perfect as the other. He's in the meeting. And then that Jehovah Witness gave his self to Christ. And then from that come his brother down to, to oh, they, you know how they, the Jehovah Witness feel. They come down to turn his brother out of, from their fellowship. He said, you listen to such a thing as that, to these false things going around like that. You've been his father's a reader in the Jehovah Witness. He said, you know better than such a thing as that. He said, if I ever see that man, I'll give him a piece of my mind. He said, I don't teach him my daddy's gimme. So that's him mowing grass out there. And I come in into the old flop down hatch, you know, and sit down and talk to him. He said, well, he said, I'll tell you, Mr. Branham, he said, we were raised Jehovah Witness. I said, that's very fine. I said, I'd rather be a Russellite than no light at all. And just uh, went on like that, not just uh, regarding anything that he, he had said and talked to him the best that I could. And I said, I see that you are a married man and you have two children. And he, I said, but you've separated from your wife. And he looked over at the banks. That's the Mr. David, uh, David Woods' his father, the one church meeting. He looked over. He thought maybe Mr. Wood had told me that. And I caught his thought right quick, you see. So I said, you thought that Brother Banks had told me that. He did not. He told me nothing about his family. But I said, maybe you think if Banks told me this. Night before last, you was with a, an auburn-haired woman. You were in the room with her when her lover come up to the door and knocked at the door, and she went to the door and wouldn't let you come, and you looked through the window. It was a good thing. It had shot your brains out. I said, the man standing there with a dark suit on a red tie. Oh, he liked to fell over the floor. I said, that's the truth. That's the truth. And there, I baptized him, and a few days later from that, here come his daddy down. Here come his... His sister down. She was going to come down and straighten both the boys out. Baptize her the same day she come by the same thing. Down come his daddy, and he was going to straighten us all out. So he wanted to take us. I said, he was a fisherman. I said, now, Banks, let's take him a fishing. So we started across the river. It rained all night. You know how it is in the east. Them rivers get up and things. We was going down to Wolf Creek Dam. And on the road over, he never said anything about religion. He had a very stern old man. And he said, um, as smart as he could be. So he crossed the river. I said, well... Uh, I saw a vision come before me there as a setting. Banks was driving. I watched the vision. I said, now, every stream we cross, uh, he had just said that night, he said, well, if I could ever see anything like it happen, I'd believe it. And so that morning, the Lord's grace, he said, wherever stream we cross will be muddy. When we get to the Wolf Creek Dam, uh, the rain went above the dam, and that, or below the dam, rather, and it won't be muddy. And we'll fish today. We'll catch nothing today until evening. And then, Mr. Wood here, Banks Wood, you're going to catch one small catfish. I'm going to catch about 20 pounds. And some of them will weigh as much as 10 pounds apiece. You'll fish with the same bait in the same place. You won't catch anything. We'll fish about 11 o'clock at night. The fish will quit biting. We'll go in and eat, and eat our supper at 11 o'clock at night, stay all night. And the next morning, we'll go out and I'm going to catch a large fish that has scales on him. And that'll be the last thing that's caught. We won't, we'll fish the rest of the day and catch nothing. And the old man looked around, kind of like that. We went out and everything happened just perfectly to the dot, the way it did. And when I come out on the planks that evening, he said, here's water. What does hinder me from being there, The whole group of them. Oh, it's a glorious thing to know that we're hanging on the tree. Now, there was... Mr. Woods and I was squirrel hunting, as you know I uh, uh, like to hunt. And so uh, we were squirrel hunting together down in Kentucky about two years ago now. I come in on my vacation in fall, and I've hunted in Africa, India, and all over the world nearly, but I just give me a foggy morning in August to sometime up with a twenty two rifle. And so then uh, I just love to hunt squirrel. And we were down in Kentucky on a two-week stay. It got real hot. Now, you... Uh, 
you uh, Californians may not know what I'm speaking about when the leaves and everything's so hot and, the, and you step on there and them little gray squirrels and we only shoot the eye only at 50 yards. If he's 40 yards, we back off to the 50 yards and shoot at the eye. If they don't, he strikes below his eye or above his eye, go change the rifle. He's something wrong. And so we stay right with it. That's the way I've tried to train myself to that, to shoot it exactly to the spot. And so then we're up there camping and it got so awful hot and them little gray squirrels, you talk about Houdini of being an escape artist. He's a minor to one of them. Just crack a little brush and tsk, he's gone. You all know Brother G.H. Brown. Just ask him about it one time. We've hunted together. So then, uh, and uh, I tease him about that old automatic shotgun his wife bought him, you know, about 20 years ago. So uh, shooting squirrels with a shotgun. So then um, we were hunting and there was, uh, Brother Wood said, you know, Brother Branham, he said, over here at a certain place, there's some hollers. I don't think you have them in California. It's down, uh, down, way down where the creeks run down to. It makes it damp. You, up on the flat grounds, you touch that uh, brush and they're gone. You can't get on them. For, they go uh, two or three hundred yards away. They're gone that quick. So then uh, we said we'll go over here and see if he'll let us hunt. So he has about 500 acres. And I said, well, that'd be fine. So we went down, not nice roads like you have here, but through hog paths and everything else, through brush over hollers till we got in there. He said, now, there's just one defect about this. He said, this old man, said, he's an infidel. And, oh, he's rough. I said, oh, I'll just let you do the talking. So I sat in the little truck. We drove up to a white, nice white house way back down the foot of a big hill and, and a big weed field and a corn patch on this side. We drove up. This two old men sitting out there, very Kentucky. And Kentucky has its own way of living, you know. Brother David back there, the... The Greek brother said, Brother Bram, listen, at your tape said, uh, this is kind of awful to say this after breakfast. He said, you mentioned a hair and a biscuit. said, I looked up, I can't find what that is. I said, that's just Kentucky. You see the hair and a biscuit. I said, don't try to find that in the dictionary because it won't be there. I said, in uh, Kentucky. So we got back there and that sassafras holler, you know, and the big old hats hanging down. We stopped. Brother Wood got out. Went around two old men sitting there, and he walked up to one of them. He called him and said, How do you do? And he said, How do you do, sir? And he said, uh, uh, I am, uh, my name is Wood. I'm Banks Wood. He said, I wonder, we've been hunting over here on Dutton. And they named their places by the cricks. He said, We've been hunting over on Dutton, and we wondered if we could hunt on your place. And he said, What wood are you? He said, I'm Jim Woods' boy. He said, anything, uh, I'm, that was one bunch of Jehovah Witness that was genuine people. He said, anything that Jim Woods, any of his people is welcome there, anything I got on this place. He said, old man, Jim, is he still living? He said, yes, he's out in Indiana now. And said, I'm living out there too. He said, I come down squirrel hunting each fall. He said, help yourself. I've got 500 acres and plenty of hollers and things. Just help yourself. He said, um, well, uh, thank you very much. He said, um, I brought my pastor along. He said, you wouldn't mind him hunting too? He said, would. Do you mean to tell me you've got to low down till you have to carry a preacher with you wherever you go? And he said, uh, so I thought it was about time he'd get out of the car. So I get out of the car, you know, and walks over there. And I said, how do you do? He said, howdy. And he said, before they could introduce me, he butted right in. He said, well, he said, I ain't got much use for you guys. I said, well, I admire your honesty. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, he said, the reason it is, is this one thing. He said, in the first place, you don't look like a preacher. Squirrel, blood, and whiskers, and hadn't had a bath for two weeks. I, mm. So I said, well, I guess that's right, too. And he said, uh, the thing that I got against you fellas, you are barking up a tree that there's nothing in. I don't know where you know what that is. That's another Kentucky, David. Don't try to find that in the dictionary. When a coon dog is a liar... He'll run to a tree, and a coon's got a trick. He'll run, jump up on a tree, and then jump off, you see? And if a dog ain't well-trained, he'll run to this tree where he's seen the coon smell, where he tracked around the tree, and he'll stand there and bark, and there's nothing in the tree. So they usually shoot that dog. <laughs> so he said, you guys, that's what you need, a good load of buckshot. He said, because you're barking up a tree, there's nothing there. You know what I mean, preaching. He said, I'm considered an infidel. I said, well, every man to his own opinion, but... Uh, to me, that's nothing to brag about. <laughs> he said, well, he said, well, he said, the thing of it is that you're, you're talking about something there, that there isn't such a thing. I said, yes, sir. I said, of course, that's the opinion. 
And he said, um, well, he said, you guys talking about a God, and there is no such a thing. And he said, if there was one, I could see him. And he said, I've lived all these years. I'm 70-something years old. and I ain't seen nothing of him yet. And he said, there's just no such a thing. And you guys are barking up the wrong tree. And you're taking the people's money for your livelihood and things like that. And you're nothing but a bunch of cheaters. Oh, ooh, my. I said, yes, sir. Of course, that's opinion. I thought, oh, God, you don't help me. <laughs> so uh, uh, I said, yes, sir, that, that's, uh, of course, opinion. I said, and, uh, you know, Mama, my old Southern Mama, always gave me good advice. And she gave me expression one time. She said, give a cow enough rope and she'll hang herself, you see. So I thought that's a good one for him. Just let him go ahead and bark a while. We'll see what tree he's up, you see. So then I let him go ahead and talk. And I found something and something comes to my mind. And there was a apple tree there that was sitting under. And long fall of the year, the apples was about the, about the last week in August. The, the apples was dropping off and the yellow jackets was eating them. You know what yellow jackets is? All right. Well, what part of Kentucky are you from? See? And so then uh, I said to him, I said, do you mind if I have one of them apples? He said, help yourself. The yellow jackets are eating them. I reached over and got it and rubbed it on these old bloody pants. You know, bit off. I said, my, that's a good apple. She said, yes, yeah, it's a dandy. I said, uh, looks like she bears pretty heavy. Yes, sir. So I get so many bushels every year. Well, how old is the tree? Changing the subject on him. You know, and he said, uh, oh, he said, you see where that old... Chimney stands up down there, said, I was born up there. I said, uh, Mam and Pappy lived there and said, and far burn it down. We built this new home down here and said, then I was raised up here and said, when Pappy and Mammy died, I, I just stayed with the home and said, and when we moved down here, I put that tree in there 40, 50 years ago or something and said, it's been there ever since. I said, that's good. I said, my, that's wonderful. He said, uh, yes, sir. He said, back to being a preacher. He said, I want to ask you something. I said, yes, sir, what is it? He said, you guys, if you could produce anything, why well, it would be different. He said, now, I heard a preacher one time, or heard of him. said, old sister, somebody up here on the hill, said she was dying with cancer. And said there was a preacher come over here to act in Kentucky, right? It was about 30 miles from there. And I, Woods looked over at me, and I, I shook my head. He said, over at the Methodist campground. He said, this preacher's from out in Indiana. And he said, and he come over there and said, they said there's about 2,500 people gathered out there that night. And that's way back in the hills, you know. They come on horseback and everything to get there. And said, he was there for three nights and said, on the second night, said, this old lady's sister lives up at a place called Camelsville. And while this preacher was preaching, he looked back in the audience way back where this woman was and called her name. And said, tonight, before you left home, you looked into a dresser drawer on the left-hand side. You picked up a little handkerchief with a blue figure in the corner of it. You've got it in your pocketbook, and you've got a sister by the name of so-and-so as dying with cancer of the stomach. Go take that handkerchief and lay it on the woman, and she'll be made well. Well, I said about midnight that night, we thought they had the Salvation Army up there on top of the hill. He said, I never heard such a roar in my life, and they were screaming. And if any of you know, that was Brother Ben and them up there, putting a handkerchief on the woman. And said, we thought maybe the old lady died. And the next morning, said, we went up there to see when they make arrangements for the funeral, and said she was sitting there at the table, her and her husband, eating fried apple pies and drinking coffee. You know what a fried apple pie is? A half moon turnover? I'm sure I'm at home. So, them, you know, I... I like that with molasses on it, <laughs> see? And uh, I don't like to sprinkle. I, I baptize, you know, and I really pour it on them. I like plenty of molasses on my pie. So uh, uh, I just love them things. And so then uh, she was eating this fried apple pie and said the day before there, she was in such a fix that we couldn't even, they couldn't no more put her on a bedpan, that they had to just use a draw sheet. And said me and my wife went up there and changed her bed twice a day and said the doctor give her up about... Six weeks before that, just give her enough phenobarbital to last her until she was gone. The cancer, they opened her up and just covered her over so I said they no need to fooling with her anymore. And said, and you know, she was sitting there eating and jumped up and run, shook hands with us. And said, I said, you don't say so. Said, yeah. Said, now, and said, if you don't believe it, said, you go right up there and see. She'll tell you herself. See, he was preaching back to me then. <laughs> Let him testify a while. I said, oh, you don't believe that, do you? He said, sure. 
said, if you don't believe it, you go right. You go right up there on the hill and find out. I'll take you up there. I said, mm-hmm. no, I said, I'll take your word for it. See? I said, I'll take your word for it. I said, say, uh, who was that guy? I don't know. He said, it's from out in Indiana, and they said he's going to come down here again. He said, I'm going to him when he comes. So I'm going to walk up to him and say, I want to tell you something, preacher. Tell me how in the world that you knew that when you was never in this country before. I hadn't been. He said, how would you ever know that? I said, yes, sir. Well, I sure hope you meet him. I said, I hope he helps you. And he said, well, I'm going. He's chewing tobacco and he wanted to spit down like that and leave. <laughs> and I said, um, you mean to tell me now back to this tree? I said, I- I'm amazed at that. And I said, you know, we haven't even had a cool night. No frost or nothing. And I said, those leaves are dropping off of that tree on the ground. And that's why we come over here. As all them flat woods where the leaves are dropping down, drying, and to get in these hollers here where they fall in the water and get wet. I said, and you, what in the world is them leaves dropping off that tree for? Well, he said, the life left him. I said, the what? He said, the life left him. Left the leaf? Yeah, I said, that's what makes it drop off. I said, well, we haven't had any frost or any sign of any cold weather. He said, well, it just it leaves them. And I said, well, what happens to the life? He said, it goes down to the root of the tree. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the winter would freeze it and would kill that germ of life in the tree. And I said, then it goes down to the, to the root of the tree to hide there until when? He said, until springtime. And it brings you up another mess of apples and a bunch of leaves. Yes, sir. I said, that's strange. I said, I, I'd like to ask you something. He said, yes, sir. I said, what intelligence tells that tree, that life in that tree, that winter times are coming? And if you don't get out of these limbs and get down here and covered with these roots, that you'll die. And that life obeys that intelligence and goes down into the root of the tree and stays down there until the winter times pass and then brings up a leaf again. I said, what intelligence does that, sir? And he said, oh, it's a nature. I said, what is nature? He said, well, it just actually does that. He seen my point, see, and he's trying to hide from it. And he said, well, he, he said, you see, I said, well, I'll tell you what. Let's take a bucket of water and set it out here on that oak post. And now in the middle of August, it'll run down to the bottom of the post and stay there till spring and come back and fill the bucket up again. Will it do that? He said, no, no. And I said, well, tell me what intelligence. It's got to be an intelligence now because the tree has no intelligence. It has to be an intelligence to make that life Go from the tree up here in the branches down to the roots and an intelligence to tell it it's time to come back up again. He said, I just hadn't thought of that. And I said, now, you think on that a long time. And when you find out what intelligence that tells that sap in the tree, that life, to go down in the roots and hide or it will die then I'll tell you the intelligence that told me who that woman was and what to do to save her life. He said, you're not the preacher. I said, I am. (laughs) There, show me, thou will show me the path to life. Though it be so simple. There, on his knees with his hat off, I led him to Christ. Show me thy path of life. To an ignorant farmer who probably couldn't write his own name, but God has a way to take a path of life to lead him to that. And brethren, we are hanging on the tree of life. 
And someday this old leaf is going to drop off. But there will come a resurrection someday. A great millennium lays ahead of us. A great resurrection. We'll come back again someday because we have eternal life. We understand it from the way of a word. If we had time, you know how it is, we could approach it by many ways. People, sometimes you have to use different methods to get to a person. Last year I went out and I thought I'd go hunt on the old man's place again. I drove up to the place and weeds just growed up all around it. I seen an elderly lady sitting on the porch peeling apples off of the same tree. I walked up. I said, how do you do? And she said, how do you do, sir? And I said, I'd seen big posted signs all around before I got in there. And I said, I wonder if it would be possible that I could hunt squirrels. She said, sir, when my husband was living, he was very odd. He posted the grounds and said, I have some boys from, lives up in Kentucky, up in Louisville, Kentucky. He said, and they come down to hunt. I said, I understood that. He told me that. Could I see him? She said, he's gone on. I said, you don't mean so, yeah. I said, well, he told me when he was living that I could hunt. He said, who are you? I said, I'm Brother Branham. She dropped her pan. She grabbed me by the hand. She said, Brother Branham, he's in glory now. She said, he lived a staunch Christian life from the hour. I said, and you're peeling apples from that same tree. I said, the apples come back again, didn't I? I said, so will he sometime in the great resurrection. And brother, sister, we can't afford to let people that we love and who Christ died for get away from this life to die without life eternal Let's do everything we can to get them into that place where that they can rise again in the resurrection. Thou wilt show me the path of life. You, brethren, are able to do it to your congregations because you're, many of you are studied ministers and theologians. I, I don't have that ability. but my little, uh, I have no ability, but a, a little gift that was given me, like to pull myself into a certain gear that were the people what they're thinking, what they're doing, and what should be done. That's a little way of my ministry. It's just one of the little paths that God lets me use to, to bring his children over to that side. And I'm joining mine with yours now. And let's show the people the path of life, that they might find the way of the Lord. And the, he says here, for there's joy in the presence of God. There's joy. As we walk down this path, looking from side to side, the resurrection of the trees, the leaves, Everything speaks of God. So let's us be as God's creatures, speaking of God and everything that we do or, or say. Let it shine forth to his glory. God bless you. Let us bow our heads just a moment now. Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the flock, I'm so glad, Lord, that you showed me the path of life. And I'm so glad to be walking down this grand old highway I'm so thankful to have my arms joined with these brothers today as we're standing by the side of the highway screaming with our voices and all the talents that you give us to that dying mass of humanity out there to which you died for. Lord, help us, will you please? May each one of our lives be a tree or something that will bring such conviction to the sinner and the unbeliever that people, they might see the way of the Lord and enter into the joys of the Lord. Grant it, Father. Bless us in our feeble efforts together. We thank you for this wonderful time of fellowship, this grand breakfast. And Father, we feel that we have just, our souls and our bodies are fed by the goodness of God. Be with us now as we go further to go into more meeting and be with us tonight and may something be done that will cause sinners to come quickly to the altar to be saved. May the sick be healed, and those without the Holy Spirit, may they be baptized into the body of Christ. Grant it, Lord. We commit ourselves to you. We take our prayers, our faith, and we place them together, lay them upon your altar, and we send it to you, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Receive us. Amen. God bless you, my brethren. And I guess now one of the brethren will come for dismissing uh, the church or the, the congregation formally as it should be. And while they're making up uh, who's coming, I want to say I thank you for your fine attendance. And I'm sorry I've kept you here until right at noontime, almost five minutes after 11 by my watch here. 
And I, I could just sit and talk to you about great things that I've seen happen to the Lord doing over in the mission fields and things of great, great things. Don't never be afraid. Just remember, God promised. God's got to keep his promise. He's just got to keep his promise. God bless you now. And Brother Borden.